Okay, so I'm going to start from the lab side. So I work in the Center for Respiratory Diseases and Meningitis here at the NICD, and I'm sure like the rest of you, the whole year so far has been coronavirus. Um, eat, sleep, breathe, dream, coronavirus. Um, and as you just see some of these headings now, it seems like we can't get past the news broadcast with hearing something about coronavirus. So I think just to um, what actually is coronavirus? I'm sure most of you know some of this background, but just to touch on it for those that may not be that familiar. So towards the end of 2019, um, there was found to be an outbreak or a cluster of severe pneumonia cases in Wuhan city in Hubei province in China. Um, following what I think was very good lab work, they rapidly detected the virus, um, which was found to be this novel coronavirus, initially known as 2019 NCOV. Subsequently, it has been named as SARS-CoV-2, being the virus, and the disease that it causes has been known as COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 19. Initially, when these first few cases were detected, it was not apparent whether there was person-to-person um, -person transmission or not. However, subsequently, as we've learned more about the pathogen, we, it has been confirmed that person-to-person -person transmission occurs quite efficiently. So the numbers continue to increase. Initially, most cases were associated with this wild, this market in Wuhan city. It is a seafood, poultry, and live wildlife market um, where they have all sorts of um, live and dead animals which are sold. Um, and initially, all cases were found to have epidemiological links to this market. However, subsequently, it was found um, as person-to-person -person transmission was occurring that um, it was spreading more broadly. Um, I think the market was shut down early towards the end of December. Um, and even subsequent to that, and after the incubation period, cases were occurring. On the 30th of January 2020, um, the WHA declared it a fake, a public health emergency of international concern. One of the main reasons for them declaring it a fake is that they were concerned about the spread of this virus to African regions and other um, sort of developing countries where we may not have the health facilities necessary to contain. Um, and to treat the patients that, that may occur with the outbreak of this virus in those regions. Then just on that, on the 31st of January, our health minister then activated our emergency operations center. And since then, we've been working together with the incident management team that meets on a daily basis. Um, and our job is to command and control our response to this outbreak. So just going into the actual virus now, so coronaviruses are a large family of viruses. They are an enveloped, single-stranded, positive sense RNA virus. RNA virus, I just want to highlight, um, RNA is, uh, degrades very easily, and therefore when I get to specimen collection and transport, I'm going to highlight the need to transport the specimens to us in cooler boxes and to store them in the fridge and to get them to us as quick as possible. And this is related to the fact that they are RNA viruses and we need to test them within 72 hours of being collected. So corona in the word coronavirus um, means crown and it's given the name as if you look at those figures on the slide, um, the virus has these glycoproteins on the surface, which when you look at it under a microscope looks like a halo or a crown and therefore it's known as a coronavirus. We have four human coronaviruses that commonly circulate around the world. They are endemic to South Africa. They have very difficult to remember names, such as 229E, NL63, OC43, and HKU1. We do detect these commonly every winter, and they cause a mild respiratory illness. However, there have been, this is the third time in history that there has been a spillover from animal species of a, a animal coronavirus into humans. The first one was SARS, that happened in about 2002 to 2003. The next one was MERS, which happened in about 2012. And this is now the third spillover from animals to humans. And as I mentioned, the pathogen is known as SARS-CoV-2. They are beta coronavirus. Um, they are thought to come from an animal origin. At the, moment, the, at the moment, the actual species has not yet been identified. Some sequence analysis has shown that there seems to be a high identity to the bat coronavirus as well as to the pangolin coronavirus. But today they haven't yet confirmed which species it was spilled over from animals to humans. As I've mentioned, we now know that there's sustained person-to-person -person transmission. And one of the questions as this evolves is, 
do asymptomatic individuals, are they able to transmit the virus? More recently, in the last day or two, there seems to be evidence of asymptomatic transmission, although this needs to be confirmed. Okay, so at the moment, so this is a rapidly evolving situation. As it's a new virus, we know little, very little about it, and it, the situation changes every day. The data so far have shown that the incubation period can range anywhere from 2 to 14 days, but has a median of about 6 days. Um, viral shedding can occur in those with low severity of disease, so even those with mild illness can shed and transmit the virus. There's also been some evidence of super spreaders, which is also known in um, the SARS and MERS outbreaks. The source of um, the transmission route is thought to be by respiratory droplets, so not airborne transmission at this stage, but respiratory droplets, and that has implication for the PPE um, that we're going to discuss just now. At the moment, what has been seen, it has a, a high um, morbidity rate, but a low mortality rate. It's thought to be about between 2 and 3% mortality rate at this stage. So as I mentioned, the main route of transmission is via respiratory droplets. Um, there has been some evidence also that it can be, um, that is, that live virus has been found in stool. And so there's some investigation and question at the moment as whether the fecal oral route can be a means of transmission. The epidemic doubling time is thought to be 7.4 days. So in South Africa, it really is early days. Um, we have now tested about 116 individuals for the novel coronavirus. We have not detected any cases at this stage, but we are on alert and we are waiting and we are preparing responses should a case evolve. There's still many questions um, that more and they hope to have one ready in about six to eight months' time. Treatments have also been limited, although I think the HIV antiretrovirals seem to have some effect. Um, but at this stage, still, um, every day there's new articles and new information, and it's a very, very exciting time in the literature. In fact, it's been called an infodemic rather than an epidemic. It's just an overwhelming amount of information that's, that's coming out. Sorry, please mute your microphone. We're hearing you on the side. Thank you. So there's been multiple responses. As I mentioned, the incident management team um, was put together on the 31st of January. Um, we meet daily and um, to monitor the situation. And we have various different streams from court health and communication, case management, laboratory, and so on. Some of the actions that have been taken is a fever screening at all international airports, as well as national airports, as I understand. We have put together... Um, uh, places uh, where the 10 designated hospitals, as I'm sure you're aware, which have isolation facilities and that we are trying to make sure that are ready to receive any cases that may occur and to be well trained on how to deal with specimens and patients with COVID disease. We have put together various protocols and various guidance documents. They are all available on the NICD website. Those documents are being updated on a regular basis, so I really urge you to go it's under, if you just search under coronavirus, or it should be on the landing page if you go to the NICD website, there's a toolkit. There are training slides, there are quick reference guides, there are every kind of form you may need. So please check that website on a, on a regular basis. So there are a variety of um, recommendations uh, in order to try and prevent the spread of this disease, and they're similar to what we would um, recommend for any other respiratory illness. Um, I'm sure you're aware of all of these, washing your hands, um, avoiding touching eyes, nose and mouth, avoiding close contact with people who are sick, and very important that if you are sick or you know those are sick, you recommend that they stay at home. So they self-isolate, they do not go to work or school. Um, then cleaning and disinfecting and avoiding contacts with farm or wild animals. These are all the typical recommendations that we make for the influenza virus, very similar for coronavirus. So these are the messages that we need to be getting out to the public. So in terms of vaccine, uh, sorry, CDC recommendations, so I think we had a slightly different um, position to other parts of the world where coronavirus is currently being found and that they are coming out of their winter season, whereas we are going into our winter season, which can be, I think it's a bit of a concern for us because in addition to potential coronavirus, we're going to have all our other normal respiratory pathogens circulating in winter. So we need to um, try and encourage um, people to get the flu vaccine um, and in addition to be on high alert for identifying any suspected cases of COVID. So 
so that they can get tested rapidly and we can then contain them. So this situation, as I mentioned, is changing so quickly. So when we put these slides together last week, really the high risk place it was considered China, and it still is the most high risk place, but I think there's about almost 80,000 cases to date, of which about 98% are all in China. However, at the moment, we are, there's some concern around South Korea, around Italy, and around Iran in terms of outbreaks um, that are happening in those countries. So um, there's even terms of changing the case definition. So really, people that come from high-risk areas uh, where we know that SARS-CoV is circulating, we ne really need to be on high alert for those individuals. Um, and like I said, that at the moment, there's 28 countries that have reported cases of um, COVID and that data is available on the WHO website. Okay. Okay. Anastasia, hi, sorry, Blair. Can you stand uh, a bit closer to the microphone or in the same position where Nicole was? Because I'm struggling to hear you on our side. Sure. Is this better? Much better, thanks. Okay. So I was saying, um, there are various types of risks that we deal with um, on a day-to-day -day basis in our workplaces and also outside of our workplaces. These include personal risks, family risks, community risks, and the unknown risks. Largely, um, the hype around coronavirus is because of the unknown risks. As um, Nicole was saying, there's a lot we don't know about the virus, but it, uh, information is readily becoming available um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, just to give you some uh, background on um, biosafety, biosecurity, and bio-risk management. These practices implemented to prevent the unintentional exposure to pathogens. This is what our um, training is actually aimed to assist with, for laboratory biosafety. Biosecurity is the protection, control, accountability for valuable biological materials for the intentional or unauthorized access to these uh, highly pathogenic organisms for malevolent purposes, uh, sorry, malev malevolent purposes. Um, Bio-risk management is the effective management of risks exposed um, or posed by working with infectious agents and toxins in laboratories. So there are various modes of transmission. In order for us to do a proper risk assessment, we need to know at least this about our organism that we're working with or our pathogen that we're dealing with. So, for example, the different types of transmission are very important in the type of mitigation strategies we implement to deal with those risks. So, direct contact, droplet uh, transmission, airborne transmission, vector transmission, these are all examples of ways that a pathogen can be transmitted. For COVID, um, the main ones that have been uh, determined are direct contact, uh, contact and droplet transmission. Airborne transmission and vector control have not yet been um, considered uh, the cause of transmission. So for the general public, the risk assessment, this is what was available from the CDC. Um, the highest at risk are obviously cohabitation with or being intimate with a partner of an infected person or providing care um, with a non, sorry, in a non-healthcare setting, so example in a home, um, and taking care of someone who is actually sick and confirmed sick with the, the virus. Um, and then there's the, the other high risk is obviously anyone who might travel to uh, the affected area, so in China. Um, medium risk is close contact with a symptomatic laboratory confirmed COVID infected person on an aircraft seated within six feet, so two meters of a traveler who is symptomatic with lab confirmed COVID. Cohabitation with or being intimate with an infected person um, or providing care for a non, in a non-health care setting, example in a home, or travel from mainland China outside of the Hubei um, province. The picture on your left uh, indicates um, your risk factors. 
So you will see the lighter blue um, around the red infected person is your um, medium risk. And then anyone further than that, your darker red, uh, sorry, your darker blue is of a lower risk. Anyone outside of that zone is not considered to be um, at risk. Um, your low risk is being in the same indoor environment. Um, so for example, in a classroom or in a hospital waiting room as the person um, with a symptomatic laboratory confirmed COVID. Um, and also on an aircraft being in seats within two rows of the confirmed. So outside of that two rows in front, two rows behind, two rows to the side. Um, interactions with a person with symptomatic laboratory confirmed COVID infection that do not meet any of the high, medium, or low risk conditions above are considered um, to not be at an identifiable risk. So what are we talking about with bio-risk management? We're talking about bio-risk assessment, mitigation, and performance. So what we've now done is we've actually just done a risk assessment on what our actual risks are in the general public. From a clinical setting, what are our risk um, areas? So healthcare workers face the highest risks of infection due to exposure rates um, of sick entering in emergency rooms or doctor's rooms. And um, generally healthcare workers need to be aware of this and need to don the appropriate PPE to prevent themselves from becoming infected. Um, they also need to make sure that they don't wear PPE outside of designated areas or affected areas such as canteens or coffee shops or any shared areas um, outside of the isolation areas. Um, they also need to make sure that they disinfect stethoscopes, telephones, computer keyboards, any shared pieces of equipment or surfaces that they might come into contact after um, dealing with an infected patient. This is general good laboratory practice. So this should be done regardless of which pathogen we're actually dealing with. So again, um, your risk assessment from a clinical perspective, who is at risk? The highest risk is obviously your doctors, nurses, and EMS. Um, it's your clinical setting in affected region where cases have been confirmed. Um, this is high risk of exposure. Um, caring for confirmed cases, poor standard of infection control practice, overcrowding in hospitals, short staffed hospitals, overworked staff, high patient to um, uh, healthcare provider ratios. These are all considered high risk, but this does not mean we all need to panic. We need to obviously be very cognizant of the fact that um, good laboratory practice or gl good clinical practice should be um, used at all times. Um, who is affected for medium risk? It's your auxiliary um, clinical staff. Um, it's your staff in isolation wards, such as your cleaners and your phlebotomists, as well as family members visiting. Any person sharing close contact with a confirmed case and not wearing appropriate PPE, and then cleaning up of large volumes of soiled materials from confirmed cases without PPE, and then also wearing soiled PPE outside of affected space. Your lower risks are patients are sharing the same hospital outside of the isolation areas. Your auxiliary hospital staff, such as your porters, radiology, cleaners, um, people not in isolation uh, wards, your messengers and your receptionists. Um, also your handymen, repairmen, they are at low risk. So anyone entering the hospital and not in direct contact or sustained contact with infected are at lower risk. Non-identifiable risks are anyone who attends hospitals in countries where the virus has not been confirmed, um, for example, South Africa at present. But as I mentioned, good clinical laboratory practice is always required and um, as there's always other risks in the clinical settings that we need to be aware of. So for mitigation, we need to, some examples of things that could be done is obviously in a waiting area at a reception desk, the reception desk can be elevated a little bit higher and fans can be placed behind those dealing with um, or screening a lot of patients. Um, you need to separate febrile patients from non-febrile patients. Um, at least consider placing a surgical mask on those who are febrile, who 
while requesting them to decontaminate their hands before entering the facility. We need to identify um, separate spaces for healthcare staff to eat um, or request that they do not wear clothing uh, that they treat patients with um, within the common areas um, such as canteens or coffee shops. Um, they also need to practice proactive decontamination and containment processes. So you think about what you touch and when you touch it. Make sure that you um, consistently are disinfecting your hands, either by hand washing or by gels. Um, if people are uh, sneezing or coughing all over the place, they need to rather do it into their elbows because they're not going to shake hands and touch doors and things like that. So we just need to be aware of that. So there are various strategies we utilize for mitigating risk. Um, the main ones are engineering, PPE, SFPs, and administrative controls. So your directional airflow, hands-free sinks, elter gloves, and self-closing doors are all examples of your engineering controls. As I mentioned earlier, um, having a fan behind um, the clinician taking a specimen helps with ensuring that any droplets do not like spray back onto their faces. So it'll go ahead of the, the, uh, the patient, but not necessarily in front of the doctor. Um, your PPE is your gloves, eye protection, respirators, your normal scrubs, booties, and coveralls. So this again depends on your level of interaction and the kind of risk that you're going to be dealing with. If you're working with clinical patients that have been confirmed, your risk is higher and you should be wearing um, a higher level of your PPE. If you do not have a confirmed case, you just need to ensure that you're wearing your, your normal masks, your gloves need to be changed between patients, and you need to also ensure that your lab coat is obviously not transferred out of um, the same environment that you deal with febrile patients to other areas as well. Again, in your labs, same story, your lab coats need to be left in the area where you're dealing with your specimens. Um, your SOPs, um, these are your donning and doffing procedures. We'll briefly cover um, how you don and doff it, um, how you deal with needle stick injuries, how you deal with spills. So these are all your, your actual ways of handling your different uh, risks. If you look on our um, NHLS intranet and you go onto QPAS, all of the um, past documents are able to assist with a lot of our SFPs for dealing with good laboratory practice and ensuring that we follow the normal standard procedures. Administrative, these are your training, surveillance, SFP evaluation, validation and verification, as well as your vaccinations. As Nicole mentioned, currently there's no vaccinations, but um, they are working on, on that currently. Um, ultimately, we have minimum requirements um, that need to be followed. Obviously, for us currently, it is good laboratory practice. As long as you're maintaining good clinical laboratory practice and you're washing your hands uh, often and you're ensuring that your PPE is worn correctly and not outside of the relevant areas, um, that is the minimum requirement that you currently need. So as I mentioned, we've got uh, mitigation control measures. We've got a hierarchy of controls. This basically just tells you from most effective to um, the least effective. So you'll see, um, and it also speaks to your risk assessment. So depending on what your risk assessment requires you to have, um, you will obviously utilize um, the correct mitigation strategy to deal with it. Um, so for, for the first one, elimination or substitution. By getting rid of a risk or substituting it for something less hazardous, um, you are actually removing the risk. So for example, um, instead of utilizing um, glass pipettes, you would use plastic pipettes. And then by no means are you ever to pipette by mouth. This is eliminating the risk altogether. Um, engineering control, so these are the physical changes to workstations, equipment, materials, production facilities or other relevant aspect of work environment that can reduce or prevent exposure to hazards. So in a laboratory setting, you're going to be using your biosafety cabinets for primary specimens, particularly specimens that um, come from patients that are 
suspected of having this virus. Um, your biological safety cabinets, though, I'd like to, to um, state, if you have them, you should be using them anyway for any specimen coming in. It shouldn't just be because now we have coronavirus that we now all need to panic and change our practices. This should be part of your regular good laboratory practice. Primary specimens should be worked with in a biological safety cabinet. Um, when we work with actual cultures, um, which is what's going to eventually be done here at the NICD, the risk is higher because of the higher um, concentration of the possible virus. That is why we will then work in BSL-3s and work with increased um, precaution. But in a normal laboratory setting, biosafety cabinets and your um, lab coats, sleeve covers, um, gloves, masks, that is more than enough for, for what you are going to be doing with, with the specimens. Administrative controls, as I mentioned, your policy standards and guidelines used to control your risks. Um, there are other documents available online and um, I highly recommend you check out what is on the WHO website and also what is on the CDC website regarding this, um, in, well, this, this disease. Um, again, practices and procedures when you're handling your specimens, you should always be making sure that your specimens are closed properly and if you can, rather use carriers and racks. Um, make sure that your specimens are in um, Ziploc bags if you transfer it from one area to another. This is just in case you drop it. Um, and again, it's not just for COVID that you're worried about. It's any other pathogen that might be in that specimen. And it's good clinical laboratory practice. And again, your PPE. You have your normal, your normal uh, white lab coats. You've got your face shield, your respirator masks. Um, these are your N95 masks. These are recommended for um, your clinicians, particularly, and if you are working with something that is highly suspect of your, your viral infection. Um, then you need to have your gloves, your sleeve covers. Um, the sleeve covers are recommended for working in a biological safety cabinet to go over your um, lab coats that are laun laundry cleaned or laundry laundered ones. And the reason for that is if you have a spill inside your biological safety cabinet, it can be maintained within your biological safety cabinet um, and it won't drench through into your lab coat. And if you have a spill again, you would then discard the sleeve covers within the biological safety cabinet and it would be contained that way. Um, the other thing I'd also like to just mention is when you're working in a BSC, you should be wearing double gloves so that your outer pair of gloves stays within your biological safety cabinet and gets discarded therein. Otherwise, if you're bringing your lab gloves out of your, your outer pair of gloves out of your biosafety cabinet, you're not exactly containing anything in your BSC. So, are all available mitigation strategies relevant to all situations? No. Using all strategies for everything would be wasteful, counterintuitive, expensive, and overkill in most cases. So how do we decide which mitigation strategies to use? This is why risks, risk assessments are so important. So we can tailor make the mitigation strategy to particular risks that have been identified. So how do we know that these strategies are effective? This is why we monitor the performance. And through audits, incidents and accidents, or near miss reports, as well as through observations. We are able to obviously change the strategies that we are using to make them more effective. I mentioned earlier what's important about uh, donning and doffing of your PPE. So the donning order obviously has to make sense. So this is just the guideline of how you would put on your relevant PPE. So you'd start with your coat, you'd put out your Put on your first pair of gloves over the cuffs of your coat, then put on your second pair of gloves over the first pair, put on your N95 mask, and then put on your safety glasses or face shield to prevent any splashback onto your mucous membranes or your eyes, for example. So your doffing order, this is where this becomes a little bit, um, in, well, not a little bit, it becomes very important. So 
the first thing you always remove when you're working in uh, in any sort of lab is your outer pair of gloves. You need to discard it using the beaking method. I will show you a video shortly on how to do that and how to then you afterwards you would have to remove your um, glasses or your face shield. So this is whilst you are still wearing your inner pair of clean gloves. You remove your coat and hang it up inside out. And once you hang it up, the reason why I say you hang it inside out is that so that anyone brushes past your coat, um, the dirty side is contained towards the wall and then doesn't brush past anything you might have contaminated your lab coat with. You would then lastly remove your N95 mask, but that it is very important how you would do it. These N95 masks are actually supposed to be single use. So you would have to put your hand over your mask, pull it away from your face, and then pull it over your head without touching the elastics um, around your neck or around your head. And the reason for that is because now you still have your gloved hands on that have now handled your coat and your safety glasses or face shield. So you do not want to take those same glo gloves and handle the elastics around your head. You'd want to pull the mask as far away from your face as possible and then just over it. Once you've done that and you've removed all your um, PPE, you would then remove and discard the innermost pair of gloves and most impor importantly, wash your hands. I'm going to quickly play you a video on the beaking method. This is the method uh, that has been developed uh, by Sean Kaufman. Uh, he was actively involved in the response to Ebola, so he developed this method to actually um, prevent people from contaminating themselves um, when they are removing their gloves. So I'm just going to play it for you guys and you can ask questions at the end and I highly recommend that you guys practice it as much as possible. This method will also be available on the intranet in due course. Hi, Anastasia, the, the sound on the video is, is off.
Okay. Is everyone happy with that, or do you want to watch it again? Hello? Hi, it's Leo. There's no sound on that video. There's no sound? Oh, no. Um, okay. Very strange because there is sound on the sound on this side. <coughs> it will be on the website though. Okay. Okay. We can see all the we can see the, 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 the actual video, but we cannot hear anything that um he's saying. Okay. Um so all right. The the video will actually be available on the website as well. We can send a link to everyone afterwards. Okay, great. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. Um, this is also on the website. I'm not sure if there's going to be time for this one either. Um, can we try it? Yeah, please try. No, we can't, we can't hear that one either. Okay. So then what I'm going to do is, this is already on the NHLS intranet. Um, so further down in the presentation, we'll actually show you how to access those videos. Um, so these are all the NHLS specific ones. Um, you'll be able to view the hand washing one, the um, biosafety cabinet one, and then what we'll do is we'll also put the, the beaking method one onto the intranet as well. Okay, great. Okay, so we can move on now. So this is just basically giving you a brief step-by-step um, -step visual representation of proper hand washing. So it's palm to palm, then between fingers, back of hands, base of thumbs, back of fingers, fingernails, wrists, and then rinse and wipe. So these are the main steps for hand washing and it should be done, it should take at least 30 seconds to, to actually wash your hands properly. Um, okay. okay. Hi everyone, it's Nicole again speaking. Um, we're going to move back now from the general biosafety information back to dealing specifically with, with COVID. Um, so we've had a lot of queries um, regarding this and regarding PPE to use and about following processes. Um, so really, if there's any questions, I'd ha be happy to address them at the end, but I'm going to try and give as much detail as I can. I think, unfortunately, because of all the pictures that are being shared in the media and on the news of everyone wearing their hazmat suits, it's creating unnecessary panic um, and really resulting in a problem with specimens because what we need in the lab is to get the specimens to the NICD as quickly as possible. And we have, what's happening is people are not sending specimens because we're labs and couriers are refusing to touch the specimens, um, the people not wanting to handle them, and that really is unnecessary. Um, I just want to make clear that these specimens should be treated no differently from a suspected influenza sample. So if you had specimens collected uh, for influenza testing, it, these would be exactly the same. They do not require any special courier. They do not require any special PPE. We'll go through the details now of what's required, but really there's unnecessary panic, and I think what's important is to be cautious, um, but at the same time just to get the specimens to us for testing. So the scenario here that's given is a patient arrives at a hospital emergency room presenting with a flu-like illness. So symptoms at the moment are thought for most cases are thought to be fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, and sometimes more severe um, illness, such as pneumonia. So this particular patient arrives with fever and is respiratory distress. distress. Um, and then they also mentioned to you that they've been traveling to China for business the previous week and worries that they may have COVID-19. What to do and importantly, what not to do. Do not panic. So very first step, uh, well, it's important to know that any suspected case, anyone that meets the case definition for a person under investigation should be treated as a suspected case until they have tested negative. So you should use the appropriate PPE, the appropriate isolation facilities, as if they are, treat them as a suspected case until it is, um, the lab is shown otherwise. So the, uh, the first step is to contact the NICD hotline. 
So not everyone that comes with flu-like symptoms, um, and it sounds crazy, but we've had stories of people that went to China more over the weekend, and now they want to be tested for COVID-19. It is not necessary. They have to meet the case definition for person under investigation. So how do you find that out? Well, you phone the NICD hotline, you speak to the doctor on call, they will ask you some questions, and then from that decide whether they fulfill the criteria for person under investigation, um, and whether specimens should be collected and sent to us. So specimens should not be sent to the lab unless they have been discussed with the doctors on call. Very important step. So this is the criteria for a person under investigation. As I mentioned, it is changing um, continuously as we learn more about the virus and also as we see more regions where the virus is spreading. Um, however, at the moment, it's a person with acute respiratory infection, which is fever, cough, sore throat, shortness of breath. Um, they can be mild or they can be severe and hospitalized. Um, and they have to meet one of the follow, at least one of the following criteria. So in the 14 days, which at this stage is thought to be the maximum incubation period prior to the onset of symptoms, they either have to have been in close contact with a con had a history of travel to areas with presumed ongoing community transmission of the virus, such as China or now other regions, as I've mentioned earlier, or they had to have worked in or attended a healthcare facility where there were patients with SARS-CoV-2 infections being treated. If after discussion with the, the doctor on call, it is decided that your, um, the patient that is presented to you meets this case definition, we will request further steps, um, being specimens um, and also being the correct forms filled in and we start the process then. So this involves a number of steps. Uh, the first one is to isolate the patient. So the patient that is suspected of having COVID-19 should be hospitalized and separated from other patients until the test results are received. A specimen must be collected as soon as possible and sent to the NICD for testing. The recommended specimen type is lower respiratory tract specimens and, and because um, the data from MERS and SARS has shown that there are specific attachment sites in the lower respiratory tract that are suited to this virus. So if possible, if it's a hospitalized patient, to collect lower respiratory tract specimens, being sputum, bronchiolar lavage, or tracheal aspirates. However, we also request upper respiratory tract samples are collected, and sometimes in the milder cases, these are the only specimens that are possible. For this, it needs to be a nasopharyngeal swab, not a nasal swab, a nasopharyngeal swab and an oropharyngeal swab that are combined together in the same universal transport medium. Those samples um, should then be labeled with the patient's name, date of birth and the sample type and sent to the NICD, which I'll get to the specifics just now. Um, another important step, is, so number one is to isolate the patient, number two is to collect the specimens and fill out the appropriate paperwork. As part of that paperwork, it is important to identify contacts. This contact line list is available um, on the NICD website under the coronavirus tab. And this is really important because should this person test positive for coronavirus, we will immediately start tracing all the contact that they have had and testing them as well to prevent further spread of the virus. So step three is to then identify contacts of that individual. So just to recap, uh, step one is report the, the person and speak to the doctor on call to decide if specimens should be collected. Um, you should have available at all times the forms, um, which include there are three forms that have to be collected for every person under investigation. One is being the specimen submission form, another one the person under investigation form, and lastly the third one is the contact line list. The specimen should be submitted with all of those three forms. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you label the tube um, with the patient's name, date of birth, and sample type. This is important because we're receiving swabs and we're not sure whether they are nasal, nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal, a combination. But please label that tube with the type of swab that has been taken. Here an example of the forms that you can find on the NICD website. On the left-hand side, you have the specimen submission form. And on the right-hand side, you have the patient, patient under investigation form. In addition to this, there is the contact line list. So it's a lot of paperwork, but it is very important. Every field is really important, and we will not, we will test, but we will not release results unless we have the correct paperwork submitted with the specimens. Um, in terms of collection of swabs, as I mentioned, for upper respiratory tract, you're asked to please collect a nasopharyngeal swab, which is what is demonstrated on the left-hand side, as well as an oropharyngeal swab. 
these are to be placed together in the same universal transport medium for shipment. Collecting both swabs increases the viral load in the sample, which increases the, our chance of detecting the virus should it be present. I've been through much of this already. Um, you'll see additionally that we request that a serum sample is collected. At the moment, there is no serological test available. However, this is in development. So if you do collect a serum sample, it will be stored for the meantime until the test is developed, at which stage we will also do serological testing on the samples. Very important on the bottom is please pay samples in a Ziploc bag. So for transport within South Africa, for national and local, they do not need to be triple packaged. The samples can be placed as for influenza samples, samples to be placed in a sealed leak proof Ziploc bag. Those, those plastic bags should then be placed into a cooler box with ice packs and sent to the NRCD as per the normal transport mechanism. For international shipments, we do recommend the IATA category B transport, which is triple packaging, but that is not needed for local shipments. Um, here is the address. It's very important that samples are kept in a cooler box with ice packs so that they st stay cool to prevent degradation of the RNA. Um, in addition, please address the cooler box very clearly with suspected novel coronavirus and to the address that is given there on the slide. This is all available on the website under the quick reference guide for healthcare workers. We do not want these specimens to get mixed up with all the others and get to us only a few days later. So if you mark it correctly, they will get to us urgently. We have requested that the NHLS laboratories use the usual overnight regional courier service. For private laboratories, they are to organize the shipment using the existing systems. If nothing is available or have a problem, please contact the CRD and parole assistance. Again, in the healthcare workers quick reference guide, there are the names of three people and three email addresses and contact details for help with shipment if needed. Okay, sorry, so just, um, so the, the, this slide then goes through the different types of specimens that can be collected for COVID cases. I've mentioned most of these already. The ideal is your lower respiratory tract specimens shown at the top, your upper respiratory tract specimens, serum samples, and then if there is a deceased case, then we would recommend that lung tissues collected from the autopsy. Um, just important for all of these, just to summarize, to transport to us as quick as possible and to keep specimens cool during transport. Um, I have mentioned previously that these are treated as biological substance category B, which means they do not need the transport systems that are needed, for example, for a query viral hemorrhagic fever. So just again, some more reminders, do not send any specimens without having first called the NICD hotline and uh, agreed with a doctor on call that a specimen should be collected. Samples must be clearly labeled, placed into a Ziploc bag and in a cooler box and sent to the NICD as soon as possible. Uh, this shows shipping requirements, um, should it be for international shipments or if it's coming by air travel, that it has to be triple packaged as shown in the diagram. Um, and these details are given in the guidelines for category B IATA shipping. Again, as I've mentioned already, just important that the box is clearly and properly labeled to make sure that it gets to us um, and can be tested as soon as possible so that um, if negative, the patient can be released and be taken um, out of isolation. If positive, then we need to start the contact tracing and various public health actions that need to follow. Um, and then, yeah, I think just summarizing again, um, what happens if the sample arrives? Um, very importantly, don't panic. Um, treat it as a normal suspected influenza sample. Um, in terms of PPE required, that is if you're dealing with a closed tube, sample tube, you need a lab coat and you need a pair of gloves. It is only when you're opening the tube that, for example, for aliquoting the sample, that you would then either need to work in a biosafety cabinet, or if a biosafety cabinet is not available, you should then use the N95 mask as well as eye protection glasses. For, for transport of the sample and for handling of the sample to get it to the NICD without opening the tube, it is just a lab coat and a pair of gloves. Okay, so just a 
Uh, this is Anastasia again. Um, just to give you some background information about the biosafety guidelines, um, there are four levels of increasing precaution. It's BSL-1, um, where you work with uh, non-pathogens, BSL-2, which is your standard pathogen work, BSL-3, which is your aerosol containment lab, and your BSL-4, which is your maximum containment laboratory. Um, Michelle will take over now. Hi everyone, it's Michelle Morgan. Um, I will just take, uh, take you through to the next slide, which is the biosafety levels increasing uh, uh, increasingly stringent combinations of facility features, safety equipment, work practices, administrative controls, and PPE. As per your um, risk assessment document, GPS 39, you will remember the hierarchy of controls and similarly, you, for your BSL level one, it's the low risk, and your control levels are, are re required are lower, and then goes to your high risk uh, laboratories where higher controls are required. Uh, designated to mitigate risk for pathogens having similar consequences of exposure. In this slide, you will see the biosafety cabinet and um, the um, one color, the blue, represents the HEPA filtered air. The purple is contaminated work surface air. And the green is your contaminated room air. A biosafety cabinet is an enclosed ventilated lab workspace that uses directional airflow to protect the user from the pathogens being handled. It is vitally important for the user to work correctly in such a cabinet to ensure that he or she is protected. There are different types of BSCs that circulate air in different ways and are used for different purposes. The type relevant to us, and in, in fact, many laboratories throughout the NHLS have the class 2A2 uh, biosafety cabinet. The three classes are the class one, two, and three. They are designed to, protect, uh, to provide protection for personnel, and that's directional airflow into the cabinet. The environment, <clears throat> for the environment, we have the HEPA filtered exhaust, and for the product, like in a cell culture laboratory, where you are, your main purpose is to protect the product, a product and there's actually no um, risk to the um, operator. You use the laminar flow or the HEPA filtered air. Almost all engineering controls involve ventilation, employ, ventilation, employ a HEPA filter for primary or secondary containment or both. So you would see that um, HEPA stands for High Efficiently, Efficiency Particulate Arrester. In some websites, it will show High Efficiency Particulate Air. The filters are 0.3 microns and filter at 99,995 percentage efficiency. The filters are all, um, it filters all particles that are bigger than 0.3 microns and all particles that are smaller than 0.3 microns. HEPA filters do not filter out gases, vapors, or volatile chemicals. So you understand that for Chemical products, if you're dealing with um, chemicals, you cannot use a biosafety cabinet. In that case, you would require a fume hood. If you look at the graph, it shows the, um, or, uh, the orange or yellow line is actually uh, set at 0.3 microns. And you can see that viruses are smaller than this. Bacteria, moles, pollen, um, sneezes, skin flakes, everything else is bigger than this. So you, utilizing the biosafety cabinet, you would actually pre be protected against everything on this slide. Uh, the only two would probably be a problem would be tobacco, tobacco and wood smoke or house dust. But um, your other uh, products where like bacteria and viruses, you are pre protected 100%. So uh, colleagues, this reiterates the importance 
of utilizing a biosafety cabinet when dealing with hazardous substances. Uh, a little bit of information about the utilization of the cabinet. Uh, allow the cabinet to run for 15 minutes prior to use. Adjust the sash, that is your, the glass um, in front, and that needs to be adjusted accordingly. Perform your smoke test, and your smoke test is um, described in GPL 0138, and um, we also have a video on conducting a smoke test in your laboratory, and that's available on the NHLS intranet under um, OSH programs, health and safety training, and last on the left is safety videos. And one of the videos there is your smoke test. Remember to read the gauges. The gauges are um, there to, to give an indication of a sudden drop or increase in pressure that needs to be monitored on a daily basis or, or when the cabinet is in use. Uh, FML 21 is the, um, the document that is available on QPALS to record your gauge readings and your smoke test, as well as, if I'm not mistaken, decontamination records. Remember to disinfect your work surfaces before and after the shift. Wipe off each item you place into the BSC to minimize potential contamination. Arrange materials in the BSC to segregate contaminated and clean items. There is also a video available on the safe and correct use of the biosafety cabinet, and this is available on the NHLS intranet under OSH programs. Is Anna speaking? I'll go through um, the disinfections um, being used to when, when you need to decontaminate your wood surfaces. So we have two um, products that we usually use in the laboratory. So you can either make a 1% bleach daily, which you'll spray down the surfaces of your biosafety cabinet, allow it to um, stay and uh, for contact time for 10 minutes, spray down with water, wipe it down. Very important to spray with 70% alcohol afterwards to remove the bleach residue to avoid that your biosafety cabinet gets corroded because um, the metal surfaces um, will be corroded definitely, all right? Um, there's also another product, F10. Um, you make a 1% dilution. You can make that weekly. You spray down your surfaces. You allow for 15 minutes contact time. You spray down with water and you can wipe that down. Um, it's very important that you lay out your and arrange your materials within your biosafety cabinet um, in a very thought out process. So make sure that you have a clean area and a designated um, dirty area and then a work area. So in this diagram, you can see we work from left to right, um, the clean side being on your left and you work in the middle and all your dirty items go onto the right. Uh, make sure that's neat and clean and organized um, all, all the time. All right, and when you set up your biosafety cabinet, you can think of setting your um, supper table. Um, we put down the, the, the glasses and the plates and your utensils nice and pretty before we dish the food. So remember when you work in your biosafety cabinet that you follow the same principle, load your biosafety cabinet with all the equipment that you need, and then after, and then the last thing that goes in will be your specimen. All right, and then um, your, your, your food and your, your leftovers or your dirty cutlery, whatever, will go down from the table first, and then you will dish off um, the remaining. All right, so, so think of this principle when you, you sort out and work inside your biosafety cabinet. All right, so when you work inside your cabinet, make sure that you perform your work at least 10 centimeters behind the front air intake of the grill. Um, you need to avoid unnecessary movement in and around the cabinet. So don't go in and out the cabinet all the time. Have a waste bin inside of, a small waste bin inside of your cabinet so you can dispose of any waste inside of the cabinet. You need to 
um, so your pipettes and your contaminant material can go inside. Um, you need to wipe down your cabinet work surfaces when work is complete. Very important. And don't leave items inside the cabinet. So when you unload your cabinet, wipe down everything and make sure that your cabinet is wiped down completely, all the surfaces. It needs to be kept unloaded. Until the next time you work, you wipe it down and you load it. All right. So it's very important to note that you can't work with chemicals inside of your cabinet, right? Especially your volatile chemicals. Um, only small quantities you can work there, but really not, it's, it's not a fume cabinet. Um, uh, most of the motors of your standard by safety cabinet do not have spark proof motors. They're not spark proof. So um, when people burn buns and burners inside there or alcohol lamps, it just, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. Um, please, we don't want you to work with your buns and burner in there because it damages your HEPA filter over time. Um, the airflow will be not, it causes too much turbulence inside of the, the cabinet and you're compromising your, your safety of, or your own safety when working inside the cabinet. Right? So there's a little nasty picture of um, a cabinet that actually exploded. All right, so uh, make sure that you, your bus safety cabinet gets tested and certified at least um, once or twice twice a year, um, but especially after it's serviced and after repairs or even when you relocate it. Um, when you work in front of or with your, in your bus safety cabinet, make sure that you sit on a proper chair that's designed with a proper backrest, um, that you've got leg support, uh, that you stay in an upright position, that you are sitting high enough uh, so that you that the sash actually helps you to prevent any splashes from inside the cabinet. And then um, keep your movement limited, limited in and outside movement and minimal side to side uh, movement. So don't cross your hands. So from the from the clean side, so from the left, you will work and pass into the middle, and then with your right hand, you will go to the dirty side. So don't try and cross with your dirty hand over to the clean side. All right, um, wear double gloves and discard the outer pair inside the bar safety cabinet. Wear your sleeve covers. Ensure that the windows are closed to avoid airflow disturbances. So remember in the labs, we're not allowed to wear or to open our windows. So make sure that the windows are closed and make sure that the room, um, no, that there is not a thorough flow of people. Um, lots of people moving past you when you're working in the bar safety cabinet. Okay, so there's a bar safety cabinet video available on the internet. And um, we will show you exactly where to find it. Hi all, it's Michelle again. I'm just going to cover a little bit on waste management. As you're all aware, we have a national a waste assurance manager. Her name is Michelle Kole, and uh, she uh, works as part of the C department team. Uh, general waste includes uh, stuff like packaging material, office paper, flowers, etc. Hazardous waste are your sharp waste, infectious waste, anatomical waste, and chemical waste. Use PPE when handling waste. This is very important. Waste management steps include identifying and classifying your waste, segregate into red, yellow, green, clear, or black color-coded containers as per the category of waste, close, seal, and label your containers, Temporarily store waste in designated areas before removal by the contracted service provider. Keep records of waste removed from the laboratory and waste removed by the contracted service provider. More information on waste management is available as POLS 0014 on QPAS. Incidents and accidents. Remember to always report incidents, accidents, and near misses on OASIS. An accident is an undesirable harm resulting in injury, 
and indicative of a failure in a system. Example, a lab exposure to a disease that resulted in the person becoming ill or a needle stick injury. Incident is an undesirable event resulting in harm that could have resulted in a more serious outcome or injury. Example, shelving, falling, but not injuring anyone and the sample splashing in a vehicle. A near miss is a, a foreseen risk that prevented a serious consequence. Example, a cable about to snap or a step about to break. Remember the uh, incident and accident um, flow chart is available in Fold 9 as Form 35. So um, your first thing would be to report to your immediate supervisor or your health and safety rep. Uh, if you need assistance, uh, contact your first aider uh, for first aid help. In terms of minor injuries, you um, apply first aid, return to work, and observe, and record the incident in OASIS. Serious injuries, you may require transfer to um, a hospital or a in OASIS, and WCL forms must be completed. Um, remember, our registration number is also available on the um, Form 35. So for needle sticks, cuts, and splashes, you follow the IOD procedure above, report immediately, call the um, HIV PEP service provider, the toll-free number is available, and record the incident in OASIS. Compensation claims um, are dealt with by the Human Resource Department and documents sent to your manager and to HR. The detailed procedure for this is in GPS 37 and that is for compensation claims. The detailed procedure for injuries on duties is in Paul's 0004 and Paul's 9 form 35 contains, um, that's where you'll find the form. Um, now, on your NHLA's intranet, you will see at the top, circled in red, is your quick links. To access Oasis, you will cl click on that. It will take you and then go down to Oasis, which is highlighted in red. If you have access, you will go into Live Application Instance. If you do not have access, you can self-report an incident. Remember, when you are self-reporting an incident, you are reporting your own incident. You cannot self-report for someone else. If you don't have access, you can ask your health and safety rep to report the incident for you. Um, the training that we mentioned a lot about is on the NHLS intranet under OSH program. On the left, you'll see the fourth one shows training, health and safety. And if you click on that, you will see all the different training that is available. The first one on the top is the health and safety rep training. It consists of six modules that the SHE officers coordinate for appointed health and safety reps. We have also um, uh, encouraged that lab staff and managers undergo this training. There's also different types of training from healthcare risk waste right down to housekeeping. At the bottom there you see circled in red is your NHLA safety videos. And this is the videos that have been developed for managers, um, staff, security, and there's also biosafety cabinet use video, um, um, a video showing how to um, conduct your smoke test, the hand wash video, and um, a few others. Okay, that brings us to the end of the presentation. If there are any questions, we can take them now. Thanks everyone. So if anybody has a question, you can send it on the chat function or you can unmute yourself and, and ask your question.
No questions? There's a question here from Nelson Mandela Academica. Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. There is a question here. Okay. It's okay. My, my question is On Hello. Friday, can you hear me? About the transport. Uh, transport as usual. The lab is open um, through the whole weekend. We are testing the whole weekend. So as usual, put them into the cooler box uh, with ice packs and send to us as soon as possible. Um, any specimens that arrive, we're working uh, in the lab, we collect them every morning, early in the morning, if they arrive during the night. Otherwise, the lab is even open on the weekend for testing. Please do not keep specimens over the weekend and wait for Monday. Send them to us. Okay, there is a, there was somebody else asking a question, but I think they've now muted themselves. Okay, uh, I just want to show also, so, sorry, I don't know how to get to it. Yeah, so they are contact details. So you should send the samples as soon as, as soon as possible. Do not wait for the Monday morning. Um, if you are worried about transport or you need to speak to one, someone to make sure they need to get to us, here are the contact details. Um, they are in the um, on the website. There's a quick reference guide for healthcare workers. These details are there as well. Um, but the Linda, Amelia, and Cardia are the people to contact. Um, we are checking emails all the time. Or you can even contact myself, Nicole Walter if you're concerned about, but normally for all specimens that are logged through the NICD hotline, we are on the lookout for specimens and we follow up on specimens that have been logged and should be on their way and we haven't yet received. So follow all normal processes, whether weekend or not. And you can also contact T if you need um, they would also like to acknowledge all GP people that were involved in putting the experiments together. And um, we saw this skip, so we don't. There's one more question. Last call. Doesn't look like it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Anastasia, and all the presenters. Just a reminder that if anybody hasn't already sent through their name, surname, and registration number on the chat, please do so. And please also send me your email address. You can email it to me or send it on the chat because we will send out a, a session evaluation um, after the session is done. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.